I just want to show you a couple of mystery cases uh, that we'll revisit during this uh, uh, talk. So uh, here's the first mystery case. Uh, what do you think about this case? Uh, here's a second mystery case. Hmm, it does look like there's something wrong with that guy. How about this one? A different patient. Okay, one more mystery case. Okay, when we think about biliary disease, there's only so many processes that can occur. By far and large, most of the processes that we see on a daily basis are benign disease. And they include stones, biliary stones in the gallbladder or common duct, various types of infection or non-infective causes of cholangitis. There may also be injuries. It may be traumatic or iatrogenic. And um, anomalies actually plays a fair role in the triage of all of the above. So the anatomy of the ducts themselves. We often worry about malignancies, gallbladder cancers and cholangiocarcinomas, but those are much less common, uh, fairly rare. Uh, but they're important to know about, so we will wrap up with those malignancies. Let's start with the benign disease, and in particular, stone disease. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because it is so common. Up to 20% of our population has biliary stone disease, and even though there are certain risk factors for stone disease, such as female gender, obesity, being at the reproductive age, hypercholesterolemia, or being middle-aged uh, to elderly for uh, worsened types of complications, uh, almost anyone can have biliary stones, and they have a pretty typical appearance. This is a percutaneous transpatic uh, cholangiogram, and we can see stones in the common duct. They have a typical geometric appearance. They stack one upon each other. They have facets that often fit into each other. They interlock in a way. Uh, they're eccentrically located in the biliary tract in the dependent location. Very typical features. Uh, when I show this, case to uh, many radiologists, they often will think, oh, there's a soft tissue mass in the central liver, maybe with some gas around it. But uh, when we look more carefully at this, we'll see, well, here's a triangle, there's a trapezoid, here's another trapezoid, here's another geometric shape. And these geometric shapes are stacking one upon each other in the dependent portion of the biliary tract, uh, and they're eccentrically located in the bile ducts. Gee, they look like stones. And indeed, if we were to get a non-con examination, we can see these stones a little bit more clearly. They're not enhancing. They have typical appearance, and we can be fairly certain about the diagnosis um, just by reasoning through the logic of what do they normally look like. When we see stones in the common bile duct, it's useful to think about these secondary signs. So again, we will think about bile duct dilatation, but up to half, up to half of common bile duct stones will occur at the time of imaging in a duct that is not dilated. There are often eccentric filling defects in dependent location, and when they're calcified, they're very easy to pick up on CT, and when they're larger, they're easier to pick up on MRI. But we come across cases like this fairly often, non-dilated common bile duct. We don't see a stone because it's a similar color as bile. Cholesterol often looks the same color as bile on CT, but when we look at our secondary signs, there's a crescenteric area of gas, and this filling defect is in a dependent location. Uh, this, so uh, when we see these signs, uh, even in the absence of bile duct dilatation, we can suggest there might be a stone in the common bile duct, and we can get an MRCP. This is particularly important at ultrasound. If we get an examination of the right upper quadrant where we don't see stones, we know that there can be a poor acoustic window, poor evaluation of common duct stones, and large published series show a sensitivity of only 25% for finding common duct stones in the hands of regular practitioners. This is the same patient, MRCP. We can see one, two, three stones, geometric in shape, stacking one upon each other in the distal duct, typical appearance of biliary stones. Another thing to uh, recognize is that if we have a 3D image, uh, we may see the duct dilatation fairly well. We can see all the arborization, the dilatation of the ducts. But it's very hard to make out a filling defect on a 3D image. It's much easier to look at the 2D image of the same patient. And here's a dilated common bile duct. And oh, here's an obstructing stone. Same patient, same exam. It's much easier to pick out the filling defect, whether it's a stone, a tumor, 
or any other object on a 2D thin section image. And so we'll show the 3D image to the surgeons, but we as radiologists will always interrogate the 2D image preferentially. Let's move on to other complications that can occur in the biliary tract. This is a patient uh, one week prior to the following exam. And the follow-up exam, we have acute cholecystitis and cholangitis. What are the findings that strike you on these exams? Well, everyone will see the gallbladder wall thickening, uh, as well as pericholecystic fat stranding. But other things to notice are the normal bile duct has imperceptible walls. The wall of a normal bile duct will be normal, uh, will be uh, non-visible uh, for the vast majority of patients. In patients with cholangitis, we will often see mural thickening of the biliary epithelium, and it's fairly obvious, especially outside of the biliary tract, outside of the liver, the extrahepatic bile ducts. Also look at the fat just at the crux of the hilum. Here it's a little bit hazy, there's fat stranding, whereas in a normal uh, patient or a normal time without inflammation, the fat will be very, very sharp, uh, much like the fat elsewhere in the abdomen. So multiple findings of the biliary tract itself, uh, not just the gallbladder, to suggest cholangitis and acute cholecystitis. We can have different variants of cholecystitis, such as acalculus cholecystitis, which occurs in prolonged fasting, chronic infection, ischemia, patients who are in the ICU. The main findings of this will be there's the patient will present with sepsis of unknown origin, and if there's a very dilated gallbladder, a dilated gallbladder more than five centimeters in diameter, we can suggest there might be a calculus cholecystitis. We can also look for gallbladder wall thickening, but that's not necessarily going to be there when we have such a dilated gallbladder. Just the distended gallbladder itself and correct clinical uh, symptoms and these uh, risk factors of ICU or very sick patient who hasn't been eating can lead us to the um, possible diagnosis and drainage of this with a cholecystostomy tube often will cause the sepsis to go away for the fever to go away. Other things that we have to be cautious about is gallbladder perforation. Normally there's a nice fat plane between the gallbladder and bowel. When that fat plane disappears, when the bowel is adherent to the gallbladder, when there's a funny shape of the fundus that seems to be stuck to other segments of bowel, uh, or um, a discontinuity of the wall of the gallbladder with a lot of fluid around it, we can be concerned about gallbladder perforation, which is a complication of acute cholecystitis. So the diameter of the gallbladder itself is also of concern if it's very dilated, uh, such as acute cholecystitis or obstruction of the uh, gallbladder itself, we would be concerned, especially if it's greater than five centimeters in diameter. This is one of the mystery cases. It's an ultrasound of a patient with right upper quadrant pain. And if you do see this, it's an uh, odd mini. Uh, what we're seeing is the gallbladder, and we see some dirty shadowing. We don't see any uh, acrogenic filling defects. It seems to be coming from the wall. The acrogenic shadowing seems to be coming from the wall. It may have a comet tail artifact, but uh, kind of this uh, unusual shadowing. That's gas. We don't need any further imaging. This is emphysematous cholecystitis. Of course, we could get a CT scan and show the gas to very nice effect, but it's not necessary. The ultrasound itself will tell you that there is an infection of the gallbladder itself with uh, probable gram-negative gas-forming organisms, and this patient will need immediate triage uh, antibiotics now are used more commonly, but occasionally surgery will be done emergently if the patient looks very sick. A corollary is this other uh, mini. Uh, what do you think about this case? We have to kind of put together several signs. Uh, this is a known triad of pneumobilia, dilated segments of bowel, and atopically located gallstones. Notice these are geometric in shape. They often stack one upon each other, but rather than being in the bile uh, spillary system, they're in the small bowel. And if you notice, there's also a filling defect here in the distal small bowel. So if you see the triad of pneumobilia, ectopic gallstones, dilated bowel, you would think gallstone ileus, and that is rigorous triad. Uh, small bowel obstruction, pneumobilia, ectopic gallstones, it occurs almost exclusively in very in elderly patients with a mean age of 74 to 80, and has a high mortality even in modern series. Uh, so it's the same age group or same demographic group, not age group, demographic group as patients who get gallstones, 
at just about 30 years later in life. Uh, so this happens when a very, very large gallstone erodes through the gallbladder into the bowel and then extends distally and obstructs the bowel. Um, to be honest, on plain film, if you were to show plain films with rigorous triad to uh, practitioners, it's sensitive only for about 17% of gallbladder ileus, or gallstone ileus. And we have to recognize that in an elderly woman who has never had surgery, who has a spontaneous small bowel obstruction, up to 25% of them have a gallstone ileus. And that was shown on two large surgical series. It's helpful to get a CT because rather than fixating on those kind of subtle plain film findings, we can see very obvious fistula between the duodenum and the gallbladder. We can see a common air fluid level, often with contrast, if we gave contrast between the gallbladder and the duodenum, we can see pericholocystic fat stranding around the gallbladder and the duodenum. And we can also see the gallstone at the transition point of bowel, whether the gallstone is bile and attenuation or has a thin edge shell calcification, or whether it's even fluid attenuation. Uh, here we have a lamellated appearance, very typical of a gallstone, or whether it's even soft tissue attenuation. And if you look carefully, this has a lamellated appearance. CT can directly visualize the gallstone that's obstructing the small bowel with a very high sensitivity and specificity. So we really do want to get advanced imaging for these patients and not rely on plain films. Here's a few pitfalls. What do you think about this case? Here's a patient with an MRCP, abdominal pain, and we can see low signal all around the gallbladder wall. Is that uh, aphysemous cholecystitis? It's very difficult to tell in MR. We obviously will look for blooming artifact, but if we were to get a plain film of this patient, it's very obvious. These are calcifications, that's a porcelain gallbladder. And the older literature would suggest that this patient would be at higher risk of developing the rare but deadly gallbladder carcinoma. The newer literature suggests the risk probably isn't as high as what was previously stated. Uh, but there is uh, this body of evidence suggesting a higher risk of gallbladder carcinoma. We can also obtain a CT scan to confirm that there's no gas, that the wall of the gallbladder itself is just calcified. But beware of calcification and gas on MR can look quite similar. What do you think about this pitfall? This is an Aunt Minnie. Here we have a clangiogram, and we see a, what looks like a diaphragm or a web in the common hepatic duct, just below the confluence of the left and right bile ducts. There's a, a little filling defect or a little linear uh, area of narrowing. Is that a real narrowing? That's actually not. It's the location where the right hepatic artery will cross the bile duct. And where the right hepatic artery crosses, that's where we will often see a small little linear filling defect or little linear area of the biliary tract. And it's not um, anything pathologic. It's just normal. It should not be called, but it's often miscalled on MRCP reports. So here's another example, just below the confluence of the right and left bile ducts, we have a linear band, that's the right uh, hepatic artery crossing, and it always crosses in this location. We can also see other uh, pseudo filling defects. If we have constriction of the ampullar vater, it may look like there's a stone in the distal duct, but if we only see it intermittently, here it seems to open up, if we see it only intermittently, that's not a stone, it's just uh, normal peristalsis or constriction of the ampulla of the uh, That applies for ERCP, percutaneous imaging, as well as for MRCP. Let's move on to diseases of the bile ducts themselves. Uh, let's start with small bile duct, duct disease. Here we see a patient who has irregular uh, alternating areas of narrowing and dilatation, but only mild dilatation of the biliary tract that involves the common duct, the common hepatic duct, the intrahepatic bile ducts. This is uh, classic for primary sclerosing cholangitis. It's an idiopathic autoimmune type of disease. It tends to occur in younger or middle-aged men and progresses inexorably to liver fibrosis and failure. It can, uh, good words to use are beaded ducts, strictures, and maybe biliary diverticula. I haven't seen this too often, actually. This can look exactly like AIDS clangiopathy but the thing is, we hardly ever see AIDS clangiopathy anymore, even here in San Francisco. It just seems that we have such good antiretroviral therapy now that we don't see this type of uh, clangiopathy. It looks identical, except it may have papillary stenosis. Uh, 
Other things on differential diagnosis include recurrent pyogenic cholangitis or other types of cholangitis, including ischemic. Uh, again, the epidemiology is uh, almost all is kind of young men. Uh, the, almost, the vast majority of them will have inflammatory bowel disease, uh, mean age of 40. So again, the complications, they lead inexorably to cirrhosis. They can have other types of cholangitis. And as with virtually any other pathology of the biliary tract, cholangiocarcinoma can occur. So whether you have stones, whether you have sclerosing cholangitis, whether you've just had prior instrumentation after you've had trauma of the biliary tract, virtually every pathology that you can think of for the biliary tract, if you read the literature, are places patients at risk of cholangiocarcinoma. So this entity, just as well, we need to be careful, look at cross-sectional imaging for filling defects for masses to exclude a potentially fatal uh, cholangiocarcinoma. What do you think about this case? This patient has multiple lamellated filling defects within the biliary tract. They're eccentrically located in the dependent portion of the biliary tract that is dilated. Here's another one that's lamellated. And the bile ducts are fairly large, although the very, very peripheral bile ducts are a normal caliber. Ring a bell? This patient has uh, recurrent infections. This is a patient with recurrent pyogenic cholangitis, which is a term that we give to this entity where multiple recurrent intrahepatic putty-like stones, soft stones, occur in association with gram-negative bacteremia or ba gram-negative infection and occasionally parasites. So here we can see a very large filling defect within a left hepatic duct. This type of disease usually occurs for in patients from Asia, although they occur rarely sporadically in uh, other races, even in North America. Uh, they have pigment stones that are soft, putty-like. Uh, for example, here are multiple stones in the dependent portions of bile ducts. Here's another uh, two stones stacked upon each other. Um, although they're associated with parasite infections, occasionally they're almost always associated with gram-negative bacterial seeding of the biliary tract. The treatment is just repetitive ERCP, and so most of these patients will have pneumobilia just because they've been treated before, especially when we in North America see these cases. Again, the imaging findings are centrally dilated hepatic ducts, although they taper to the peripheral areas. They may have stones and they may have multiple liver abscesses. We can also get benign, just ascending cholangitis if a patient has had a stent or prior injury, prior trauma. So risk factors including uh, any types of stones or stents, tumors, even pancreatitis. These patients do not have intrahepatic stones, and they often have Charcot's triad of pain, fever, and jaundice. But it's helpful to look at the CT to look for areas of mural biliary epithelial thickening, uh, fat stranding around the liver hilum to help make this diagnosis. And here's an intrahepatic biliary abscess. Let's move on to large duct, duct disease. We've been talking about dilated ducts, but what if we just see a area of dilatation of the common duct that's out of proportion to the amount of duct dilatation elsewhere in the biliary tract? Well, this is what we call a colodocal cyst. You just have a dilatation out of nowhere in the bile ducts, and you may have dilatation of other ducts, but that one duct is out of proportion dilated, and there's no real cause. This is a congenital abnormality, but it's not just something that we mention and then blow off. These patients are at risk, really severe risk, for developing uh, cholangiocarcinomas. The other thing is they may have stasis and develop stones. So along with the 3D image, it's important to go through the 2D image. And we will flip through this. We can follow this duct down. And then here, we can see in the distal common bile duct, there's a filling defect that's a stone. Another thing that's critical to point out is also, does this bile duct communicate with the pancreatic duct. And here we can see the pancreatic duct is coming into the bile duct and forming what we call a common channel. And that may be one centimeter or one and a half centimeters in length or more. And if you see the common channel, that increases the risk of this patient developing cholangiocarcinoma. The correct treatment is complete excision of the colodocal cyst and separating the pancreatic drainage from the biliary drainage that will decrease the risk of cholangiocarcinoma. So the treatment of this congenital abnormality is critical to prevent cholangiocarcinoma in patients. And we do see these patients come back when they're young, 23, 24-year-old, beautiful people with fatal cholangiocarcinomas when they're not treated appropriately. <laughs>
So just to review different types of cold local cysts, there's a type one, where there's a fusiform dilatation, type two, where it's a more of a sacular dilatation, type three is a cold local seal, where it extends into the um, duodenum, and then other types as well, including Corollis. But are they treated any different? They're all treated the same way, except Corollis, where you cannot reset the, uh, the cysts or the cold local cyst. Uh, they need complete excision and they need separation of the pancreatic duct from the common bile duct to prevent cholangiocarcinomas and to reduce symptoms. So regardless of the type, uh, if you see a focal dilatation of the duct, just call it a cold local cyst. The type is secondary. The treatments are virtually the same. Here's an example. 23-year-old beautiful young woman comes in. The patient had a cold local to duodenal anastomosis when she was a child, an infant. And the surgeon did not take out the entire cold local cyst. Now, there's a gigantic cholangiocarcinoma, six centimeters in diameter. This patient didn't survive six months. It's a tragedy that can be avoided if we recognize that this is inappropriate treatment. We really have to take out the entire cyst. Let's look at other iatrogenic uh, types of injuries. It doesn't have to be iatrogenic, but in cholecystectomies, often we'll see a little bit of drainage of bile into the gallbladder bed that's a biliary leak. It happens. It's not uncommon. And even with excellent surgical experience, it will still happen in about 2% of patients, 0.5 to 5%. And it's because sometimes we have a duct that will drain directly into the gallbladder itself from the, um, from the uh, intrahepatic ducts. These patients present with vague symptoms, and they can have jaundice later on when they have uh, secondary obstruction of the ducts just from inflammation from the bile leaks. And we can recognize this at ERCP as a leakage into the gallbladder fossa. Diagnosis can also be obtained by percutaneous transhepatic uh, cholangiography or centigraphy. In all cases, it's important to clamp any drains that are present so that if there is a leak, the contrast doesn't just go out into the, uh, into the drain, but rather localizes into the region of the leak. We have to recognize there are several types of anomalies that occur, in particular, the right posterior branch. Let's review the anatomy very carefully. There's a common bile duct. There's a left duct and a right duct. And the right duct usually is the confluence of the right anterior and the right posterior duct. But this right posterior duct is highly variable, such that only about half of people have normal anatomy. And uh, many other people will have a right posterior duct that drains directly into the common hepatic duct or into the gallbladder itself or even into the cystic duct, and that these anomalies can lead to complications because the surgeon doesn't know about them. For example, if you have a, a cystic duct or any of these variants, if you were to remove the gallbladder itself, you'll have a little bit of a bile leak that goes into the gallbladder fossa itself. Another complication besides the leak is actually obstruction of the bile ducts. Uh, this can occur, for example, if you have a low medial insertion of the uh, cystic duct. And again, the complications of obstruction are similar to um, across the board. It's about 1 or 2%, even with experience. So bioduct ligation can be reversed at surgery. You can do a ductoplasty to re-anastomose bioducts. Um, and duct exclusions are something that we would look for. What are the different types of injury? They have a classification scheme called bismuth classification. And very simply, the easiest type of injury is type one. That's when you just have a very simple leak or a very simple obstruction or injury just above the level of the cystic duct. As you get progressively higher in the duct or progressively larger segment of the duct, it becomes a more difficult surgery to perform to repair these injuries. So type two will occur high up uh, away from the cystic duct and near the liver hilum. Uh, type three would be involve a large portion of the common hepatic duct, and type four would involve actually the confluence of the right and left ducts. So you don't have to remember exactly the system, but you can remember that the higher it goes and the more of the duct that's involved, the worse the prognosis is and the more severe the surgical uh, treatment will be. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on malignancies, um, something that um, we often look at are little soft tissue areas in the gallbladder itself. There are two things that are benign that we often see very commonly. One is adenomyomatosis, the other being gallbladder polyps. 
What is adenomyomatosis? It's wall thickening, particularly of the fungus of the gallbladder, but can occur anywhere in the gallbladder, usually the fungus. It's associated with gallstones and occurs in up to 7% of all patients uh, at autopsy. Often what we'll see are little cystic, very small cystic, less than one centimeter diameter, areas in the fungus of the gallbladder that have a little bit of hyperemia, and that's due to dilatation of the rotacanshi ashoff sinuses. Uh, it can look like a little blob on ultrasound, but on MR, we can see very distinctly what they call a string of pearls appearance in a pinched off gallbladder. Uh, can assume a figure of eight appearance. This is typical of adenomyomatosis. It's benign, doesn't require any follow-up. Uh, although they are associated with stones and maybe the patient will have treatment of the stones. Another very common finding are gallbladder polyps. They may be associated with cholesterol losis. Uh, in this case, this is a proven adenoma. It enhances from the non-con examination, may wash out a little bit. In general, if they're large, they may require a cholecystectomy. But if they're asymptomatic, if the patient's young, we can follow them up with imaging. If they're older, if they're symptomatic, you may just remove the gallbladder just to uh, avoid uh, any possibility of it becoming cancer. But these rarely ever become cancer, only about 1% to 2%. They're not like colon polyps. Uh, gallbladder polyps, small bowel polyps, gastric polyps, they tend to be benign. What do you think about this case? This is a ERCP. Here's a gallbladder, look okay to you. Uh, often you'll be presented with something that is familiar, but where you're just not used to that particular modality for imaging uh, the entity. And in this case, we can see there's a bite-sized regular uh, filling defect in the gallbladder itself. It's not at the fundus, it's fungating. This is a gallbladder cancer. It's much easier to see on cross-sectional imaging whether it's ultrasound, CT, or MRI, we often see fungating mass, often eating into the liver, and often with lymphadenopathy. Gallbladder cancer is almost universally fatal. Five-year survival, about 1%. It usually occurs in elderly patients, almost always with gallstones, and they're almost always adenocarcinomas. The reason they're fatal is because they often will have lymph node involvement at the time of diagnosis or other uh, metastases in the peritoneum, GI tract, or lungs. For example, here are some small tumors in the gallbladder with gallstones, but already we have packed lymph nodes around the liver hilum. Uh, this patient was not resectable. Uh, so these patients have a very poor prognosis. If we go to the bile ducts themselves, features of malignant strictures rather than benign strictures are uh, that they have an abrupt shelf with the eccentric um, shelf or eccentric narrowing, uh, irregularity of the uh, narrowing itself. Benign causes would be trauma, gallstones, or ischemia, whereas malignancies would include a primary malignancy or secondary metastases to biliary tract. So again, malignant features, if they're more proximal, if they have abrupt shoulders, if they have a mass or eccentric location of the uh, lumen, those are all features that are concerning. And we have to recognize that brushings and cytology and biopsy are only about 50% sensitive. So even if the cytology comes back negative, if we see something that looks malignant, we need to keep calling it. Because if you biopsy three times, there's still about 12% uh, false negative for that patient. The biliary malignancies have a predilection, a tendency to occur right at the liver hilum where the right and left ducts come in. This is called a Klatskin's tumor, where we see dilatation of the right and left ducts with a little filling defect right at the hilum. But they can also occur in the periphery. And when they occur in the periphery, they're just not a mass. They have typical features of capsular retraction. It's a scurrous, fibrous tumor that causes retraction of the biliary capsule, of the liver capsule. They also will almost always cause bile dilatation, and they will often, as well, have little fingers of tumor that crawl along the dilated bile ducts. These are very typical of cholangiac carcinoma. So it's not just a mass. It's a mass that's retractile, that's bile duct dilatation, and tumor fingers. And they may also have delayed enhancement. Here's an example. We have a large mass, dilated bile ducts. If you see dilated bile ducts, immediately think cholangiac carcinoma as a possibility. We have retraction of the liver capsule. Here's another example of a little mass in the liver hilum, but we have quite a lot of bile duct obstruction, bile duct dilatation. We don't usually see that with a colon cancer met or HCC, and we can see a finger extending through the bile ducts. 
in this case. Here's just another example of a mass uh, in the left lobe and right lobe of liver, and we can see a finger of tumor extending down the common bile duct. Uh, that's very typical of a cholangial carcinoma. So in conclusion, we covered benign disease, and in particular stones that often stack one upon each other or are geometric in appearance, different types of infection. We want to look for biliary mural uh, thickening and new, uh, uh, new abilia and various anomalies that can affect triage as well as malignancies. Let's go over our mystery cases. This is a patient without bile duct dilatation, but we do see a crescent of gas. We have to suggest the possibility of a common bile duct stone. Indeed, there was a stone at MRCP. Here's the ant mini. We see rigorous triad of stone or pneumobilia, dilated uh, ball bile, and uh, ectopic gallstones. This is a case of, um, of uh, gallstone ileus. Usually occurs in elderly women. Here's a picture of a gallbladder in a patient with abdominal pain. We see dirty shadowing, that's gas, emphysema to sclerosis status. Here's a patient where we see fat stranding of the gallbladder itself, thickening of the biliary mural epithelium and fat stranding around the bile ducts themselves. It's a patient with cholangitis and acute cholesterol status. And finally, uh, this is a patient who has had a cholecystectomy, but not only a cholecystectomy, had a bile ductal ligation. So this patient will need surgical revision.